Good morning, EcoBuild. My name is Julie Hirigoyen. I'm the Chief Exec of the UK Green Building Council. And we're delighted to be lead partner here at EcoBuild once again. Um, we're particularly interested in the eco bit. Um, so, uh, um, yeah, that's what this session will focus on uh, above all else. And this is the first of three leadership insights sessions, which we, UKGBC, are hosting here, one on each day of the conference. <clears throat> um, leadership itself is pretty critical to our mission at UKGBC. For those of you that don't know us, we're a charity um, and a membership organization, and our mission is to radically improve the sustainability of the built environment. So without uh, cultivating leadership at every stage or every link in the chain, um, we recognize that that's probably going to be quite challenging to achieve. Um, so leadership is, is, is really important in that context. And when I talk about leadership and when we're talking about it um, with, our, with our panel today, um, we're really talking about leadership at different levels. So industry leadership, organizational leadership, and also individual or personal leadership, which is absolutely critical um, as well. So um, we're placing ever more emphasis on, on understanding what constitutes leadership in the sector. Um, and that's very much behind the sort of way in which we've curated these sessions um, here, here today and um, uh, tomorrow and the next day. So today's main conference theme is homes. Um, so we've gathered uh, with us today um, some of the housing industry's current leaders, some of its leading sustainability thinkers, um, and also some of its future leaders. Um, so on that note, I'd like to introduce the four panelists for this session. Um, Closest to my right is Debbie Hobbs, who's the Sustainability Manager at Legal and General Property, um, one of the largest institutional property investors in the UK. Next to Debbie, we have Chris Brown, Executive Chairman of Igloo Regeneration, which is the UK's leading responsible real estate business. Next to Chris, we have Sarah Pratt, um, Head of Corporate Sustainability at Barrett Developments. Barrett's vision is to lead the future of house building by putting customers at the heart of everything that they do. And next to Sarah, last but not least, we have Alex Wiley, Head of Asset Sustainability for Affinity Sutton, who's also an alumni of UKGBC's Future Leaders Programme 2014. So a very warm welcome to you all. Now to kick us off, I'm, um, and, and because you leaders like a challenge, I'm going to set out um, five of the main challenges that I, um, uh, that, that, that I think of when, when I think of the future of sustainable housing. At the top of the list, unsurprisingly perhaps, um, are quantity and quality. We just heard, for those of you who were in the session immediately before this, um, a number of panelists talking uh, in some detail about the dual challenge there. So quantity, in other words, the supply of new homes and the sheer number of homes that we need um, in the UK and quality, by which I really mean the performance of those homes across a variety of different um, performance areas. So we need to be building somewhere between 200 to 250,000 new homes in the UK uh, within every year within the next decade. Now, quite apart from the challenge of achieving those numbers, which by the way, we're nowhere near achieving yet, is the uh, question around what, to what sustainability standard will we be building those homes? Um, we, uh, you know, quite, quite how we balance that quality and quantity issue um, in, the, in the sort of current push for numbers is a, is a fairly live question, particularly in the face of what have been some fairly major uh, policy U-turns in this respect in terms of, um, you know, uh, abandonment of almost 10 years of investment in zero carbon, new home policy, um, and um, various other sort of red tape uh, slashing efforts, um, which are diminishing the environmental requirements, particularly around natural capital and biodiversity and those sorts of things um, for, for new, new housing developments. And, and by quality, I don't just mean energy efficiency um, and carbon, I also mean the people performance of homes, so um, their ability to promote the health, happiness, well-being, productivity of their residents, and so on. So some fairly big challenges there. The next big one that I've listed on, on, on the slide is the, um, which is often quoted actually by house builders themselves, is the lack of desirability uh, for sustainable homes. So in other words, 
home buyers tend to, um, when asked if they would pay more for a slightly greener home, they tend to unsurprisingly perhaps say, no, I wouldn't fancy that. Um, but the truth is that, as we know, um, you know, given the shortage of homes out there, developers can probably sell almost anything. Um, and the real art in stimulating demand, as the likes of um, various retailers have demonstrated, is in making it easy, affordable, and attractive. So, so quite how we do that for the sustainability of homes is, is absolutely fundamental to um, making them more desirable. Obviously, that issue of affordability is a major challenge in itself, particularly as house prices in some parts of the UK, including London, have run away with themselves and are uh, um, overinflated in some places, probably due to that supply shortage. Um, a colleague of mine um, neatly put it like this, how do we solve the generation renty something crisis, which I thought was quite neat, um, generation renty something being um, a, an acute case in point. And finally, as if that wasn't enough for us all, we have a major retrofitting challenge here in the UK. So a lot of our homes are among the oldest, draftiest, and least energy efficient um, uh, compared to many of our counterparts across Europe. Um, how are we going to tackle that? How do we make uh, the retrofitting agenda desirable and by when? Um, so, panelists, some fairly chunky challenges for you to respond to. I'm going to ask you each to come up one by one and give us five minutes of your sort of initial responses to that, and then I'll um, open up to the audience and, and chair a Q&A. So, Debbie, if I could pass over to you. Hi, everybody. Um, they say never start with an apology, but as you will have noticed, I'm not Bill Hughes, who's the managing director of Legal and General Property. But as somebody just said, as it's International Women's Day, then I think it's great that there's more women on the panel than, than men at the moment. <laughs> um, so um, I'm head of sustainability at Legal and General Real Assets. And I'm just going to spend a few minutes telling you the different kind of housing initiatives that we're getting into, and also how I I'm looking at sustainability across those. Um, I think the first thing to say is, as legal and general property, we are hopefully fairly well known now as having good sustainability standards in all our commercial property. So it was no surprise to me a few years ago when Bill Hughes said to me, but we need to make sure we keep this standard across all the housing initiatives that LNG take part in. And that's no easy task when you're looking at the housing market. So my background, I'll declare at the beginning, is I'm an engineer. I'm a building services engineer. I am not a, a property sort of investment guru. Um, and my challenge is how do I make this sort of happen on the ground? Fascinating. As a legal and general, there's a whole area up there on the screen of different kinds of residential and housing areas that different parts of the company are getting into. And part of the ethos is that we are an institution investor and we do have a lot of long-term capital across all sorts of different parts of the business. So we're investing in student accommodation, a lot in residential care, looking quite heavily at the concept of retirement living and retirement homes, um, whether that's uh, buying a building to buy or whether that's renting long-term, um, very much in a sort of American concept from where I've seen it. Then we're looking, obviously, the build to sell and also the build to rent. The build to rent is sometimes referred to as PRS, but I've been told if I use that term, I get sacked, so <laughs> let's do it publicly. Um, build to rent is the kind of new concept that in the future, will we really be able to buy homes? Will we be able to afford to buy a home in our lifetimes? Um, in Germany, in Holland, in America, a lot of people don't even anticipate they'll ever own a home, they believe they're going to be renting all their life. So is that part of the solution, I guess? And then finally, which I think I can start to address a few of Judy's points, is in the press recently, um, luckily it's uh, been announced that there's LNG Homes coming to the fore. LNG Homes is setting up a factory in Leeds, which or near Leeds, which will be the largest um, modular house building factory in Europe. So that, for me, was quite a relief, although a lot of people said, you know, isn't this very different for LNG? 
because when you're building modular, you can certainly start addressing like the quality side because you're constructing off site, so you're looking at the air tightness, um, and you can do a lot of quality <coughs> checking. Hopefully, you can also uh, address the affordability because you're re producing modules in a factory to whatever design and type. And you can also start addressing some of the labor market issues. You know, is, is the market there to buy, build these homes? And also the time scales. They'll be sort of transported to site on the back of low loaders. Once the infrastructure's in, then they go up fairly quickly. My challenge in all this is um, what kind of things in terms of sustainability will these different markets need? So build to rent, um, we will probably be involved in managing that for a long time into the future. So anything that pays back in less than 20 years makes sense to us because we will be managing it and operating it, which brings into all sorts of exciting kind of technologies of things like battery storage that's emerging. So there is another group in LNG looking quite heavily at how we can help promote the battery storage areas. Will you actually be able to have PV on your roof store the energy in a battery during the day when you're not there and use it at night, possibly sell the excess back to the grid. What will the future of sustainable homes really look like? And I'm not saying that we're going to do this and have got all the answers, but there are different angles that we're looking at. Obviously, passive house is a big you know, question mark, but back to Julie's desirability, does the market in the build to sell market really understand words like passive house? And I think to do that, we've got to translate what it means. So minimum running costs, a good environment, good communities that you're going to work into. So there's lots of things we're very keen in. I'm conscious I haven't got much time. But um, those kinds of lists down there, especially things like community, placemaking, social value. Well, we're doing all this. Can we be adding social value with local authorities getting their budgets cut by 60%, I think, by 2020? who's going to help all with the apprenticeship schemes and generating community value out there. And if we can do zero carbon voluntarily, who knows, um, it's embedded carbon that we've really got to look at. So, Great. I'll Thank hand you. Over. <laughs> Chris. I think you Thank you. Hi, I'm the token man this morning. Um, it's much better than the male pale stale panels, isn't it? <laughs> So uh, we're, we're just a, a tiny little minnow in this world. Um, and I think there's lots of different potential futures for uh, sustainable homes. And I think you'll, you'll see a number of different angles today. Um, this is just a glimpse of, of what Igloo is doing. We're trying uh, to challenge, I guess, something that's quite a, a concentrated house building industry on the whole building to the lowest common denominator often in unsustainable locations. Um, I tend to refer to it as the build and bugger off model. Uh, and we're trying to look at things a bit differently. This is the approach that we take. Um, we call it the igloo footprint. It's not dissimilar, I guess, to a number of other approaches you see in, in forward looking companies. But we're very focused on health, happiness, and well being. Uh, on design, on environmental sustainability, um, and on social progress. So it's a slightly different approach to the profit-driven one that you might have heard a bit more about in the previous session. Um, so we're, we're attacking the challenge in, in different ways, um, mainly trying to do things differently. The first difference for us is custom build. Um, this is something that happens across the world, actually, except in the UK. Uh, and it's weird because three quarters of people in the UK won't buy a new home from any volume house builder, which is a fairly damning statistic. But just over half want to build their own home, which is telling us something uh, fairly enormous, we think. So we're coming up with this. In fact, we've stolen the idea from Holland, I, I'll admit. Um, custom build process where the, the way it works is that first you raise your mortgage and we provide uh, a variety of specialist stage payment mortgages for the process. Then you pick your plot 
first come, first served, fixed price. In Amsterdam recently, I've just come back from Amsterdam over the weekend, um, people queued for three weeks to get the plot they wanted. And then this is where it becomes particularly different. So a bit like buying a car, you choose your home manufacturer, and we provide a selection of different organizations that will build a home for you. You might want to design a home. You might want a particularly green home. You might want a particularly cheap home. Rolls-Royce, Mini, whoever you are, there's one for you. And then you choose the model that you want, um, the big one, the small one, the medium one, and you customize it with the home manufacturer. And then the home manufacturer goes off and builds it for you. And you've seen this image before, but this is the sort of thing we think you'll end up with. This is actually uh, the real scheme, apart from the hands that we're bringing forward in Cornwall as our proof of concept at the moment, um, with those houses in that order, one from each different home manufacturer. But it's not just about the houses, it's also about the wider neighborhood. Um, and one of the other things we're doing is bringing in uh, community energy networks, community-owned microgrids on development. So this is one uh, in Nottingham. Um, we've just been awarded uh, a large grant, and we're just waiting, waiting to hear from Innovate OK, UK to see if they, I should have said Innovate OK, that would be better, to see if they're going to approve the other part of the, of the funding. Um, and the idea here is to use a number of things that David was talking about, the batteries, um, the renewables, essentially finding ways to take a neighborhood off-grid, but we're trying to work out how to do that in a replicable and commercial way. And we're not just doing this in Nottingham, we're also doing it in, in places like Glasgow. Um, and in fact, we're doing it, and hoping to do it anyway, uh, outside of here. So when you come back, perhaps not next year, but the year after next, um, we hope that you'll see floating outside of Excel um, some custom-built houses linked up to a community energy grid and looking something like that. Um, floating homes, you know you all want one. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Sarah. Good morning, everybody. My name's Sarah Pratt. I'm the Head of Corporate Sustainability at Barrett Developments PLC. Um, some of you might have heard of us. Um, we are uh, the largest volume house builder in the UK, um, and I'm here to dispel maybe a couple of the myths that perhaps Chris has just tempted me with. Um, my role within Barrett is uh, to facilitate and lead the development of a sustainability framework for the, for the group which is very broad-based, um, and it actually looks across environment, economic, and social issues. So it does have eco, but it also has to respect uh, the needs of um, the social requirements of housing, as well as the commercial imperative. My role is to uh, support the integration of this framework throughout the company. So Barrett, um, those of you that um, aren't aware, um, we sold 16,500 homes from Portsmouth to Aberdeen in 2015. We spend over a billion pounds per annum on land and over two billion per annum on construction materials, employing 6,000 people, supporting 53,000 suppliers and subcontractors. Our vision as a business is building excellence. We have four main priorities, customer first, great places, leading construction and investing in our people. They're underpinned by five principles. Safety, keeping people safe is our number one priority. Safeguarding the environment. We operate as a trusted partner. We aim to build stronger communities and we have to ensure the financial health of the business. The example I've given on this slide uh, is of Leithfield Park. It's a development uh, down in Godalming. Um, and this actually does have an element of custom build in it. 
um, which uh, at the moment I believe um, there are a number of developments, a number of houses there that have been um, already completed and the build programme will run until August this year. It's also a code for sustainable homes f level four development, um, has a green link running through it which will support um, boost of um, health and well-being. It has also uh, a bat roost and I believe uh, a badger set, although no badgers have been seen as yet. CCTV is waiting. Is sustainability important to Barrett? It's not going on. It is. As you can see from the slide, um, we have a range of significant social, environmental and econ economic contributions that we make. I've mentioned some of them already, but in terms of social value, in 2015, um, we supported 327 apprentices and trainees and new graduates across our group. 57% of the homes that we build were built on brownfield land last year, and 18, just over 18% of the homes that we built were affordable, which is um, 3,000 homes across the UK. A little known facts uh, that sometimes uh, go unmentioned are the number of community facilities that we also build um, and also the number of school places that we also um, provide for through contributions. So as I say, sustainability is important for Barrett. Um, there has been a direct commitment by the board and the executive last year to become the leading national sustainable house builder and to integrate sustainability within the business over three years commitment from the top means that my role reports directly to the chief exec. We're certainly on a journey though I would say with relation to sustainability. We've got some good credentials, we've got some good track record um, and if I'm going to use another overused construction reference, we've got firm foundations but we're certainly on a, on a journey. There are a range of exemplar developments around the UK that we have um, and we can build on this experience that we have gained over a number of years, but what we need to do is make that mainstream and take that into more of our developments around the UK. In terms of um, business case for sustainability, there's some of the statistics there in terms of our ratings and the awards that we have won in the previous year. We've committed um, to maintaining our, um, we've committed to clear and transparent reporting on climate change, maintaining our position in the carbon disclosure project, the investor-based index. Um, we have a, a, a goal to reduce our own carbon intensity in, by 10% by 2025, based on our 2015 baseline. And we're committed to developing innovative, cost-effective solutions with our supply chain to achieve this. But we have to work closely um, to build more energy efficient homes, we have to work closely with the full endorsement of our customers. Um, quality, as you mentioned at the, the, the top of the presentation, Julie, is important in terms of um, will our customers like it? Is it a high standard and can we maintain um, our reputation in relation to quality uh, of build? The housing crisis does mean that we have to build faster we need to build to a consistent build quality, maintain our excellent standards of customer satisfaction, but we also have to diversify our construction techniques and reduce reliance on trades with skill shortages. These are all very real challenges in the housing sector at the moment. And we're still focused on delivering improved energy efficiency consistently across the UK in a way that's acceptable to our customers. And we're still building, of course, to higher standards in Wales and Scotland. What does sustainability leadership mean in the context of the current house building industry? It means that sustainability should be core to the business. It means actually demonstrating leadership by listening to all of our key stakeholders and balancing those needs effectively. We have some challenges around affordability, access to home ownership, and also sustainability, and all of those have to be balanced together. Leadership means partnering to solve sustainability challenges. So the work that we've done with AMC4 in the past, where we partnered with Quest Nicholson, is a really good example of that. 
And we also need to look at alternative methods of construction. So we are looking at a range of different um, possibilities at the moment and trialing those on some of our sites. It's an exciting time for our business. We're actually going out and actively engaging directly to all of our key stakeholders at this very moment about what is actually important to them in terms of sustainability. Um, and we're asking the question directly, and I believe in the house building industry across uh, nationally, that's possibly the first time a national house builder has actually done that directly. Um, we're also very aware that um, the increase in demand and speed of building will put long-term pressure on materials and resources. So we want to push also our focus onto um, how we can work with our supply chain to help them be more efficient and sustainable. Um, we actually, this year, uh, in January, actually have just announced our partnership with the Supply Chain Sustainability School, which is gonna offer free resources and workshops to all our 200 material suppliers. Um, and to support them in creating a more sustainable future for house building, and that may help with the embedded carbon issue that you mentioned earlier. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. That's great. <coughs> Alex, go for it, and then we'll do Q and A. Okay. Hi. Yeah. So I'm Alex Willey, head of asset sustainability at Affinity Sutton. We're one of the country's largest providers of affordable housing. We've got about 57,000 homes from uh, Newcastle in the northeast down to Plymouth in the southwest. And when thinking about the future of sustainable housing, and uh, on the Future Leaders course, actually, we're often asked to think about what the world will look like in 2050. Not that. Um, and. This is actually what the 1960s television program, The Jetsons, thought that housing would look like in 2062. And they were actually right about a few things back in 1962. Uh, the Jetsons predicted Skype, they predicted 3D television, they even predicted sunbeds. But were they right about the design of our housing? Well, actually, for me, I think that's a bit of a distraction. I think it's often said that it's not necessarily about the buildings, it's more about the people that live inside of them. And if that's the case, then shouldn't we be talking about the future of sustainable living rather than the future of sustainable housing? And as housing associations, shouldn't we therefore be moving away from the component physical element level of the decent home and start to think about, OK, what would actually make a decent life, a decent community? If we go to a community and we see that the needs there are actually for a warm, affordable home with access to employment and access to broadband in order to pay their universal credit, then why aren't we delivering that instead of just replacing the kitchen and bathroom every 30 years? And when you start to look at all of the aspects that could make that up, how do you then start to value the different um, aspects that might make up a future of sustainable living? We're doing some research at the moment to try and discover the well-being valuation of a warm home. That is the amount of money you would have to compensate someone for to achieve that same level of well-being. So that we as an organization can start to judge between how much well-being a new kitchen creates versus how much well-being a warm home creates. And when you start to think down the value chain, you have to start considering what does the resident and the person living there actually value? And is there some hidden value, things that previously we hadn't thought valueless that in the future will hold a value such as well-being? When you think about the airline industry and the way that they've done things, you know, it was only a few years ago, we might not have been so prepared to perhaps pay for our seat in advance or pay to board before others, unpopular though it may be to talk about the airline industry here. So I think whatever the market mechanism, whatever the value uh, model, whatever the design of the housing, it's clear that people need to be at the heart of the solution. So if we've got that as our objective, the future of sustainable living, then how do we start finding solutions to get there? Um, housing associations historically have been very good at benchmarking within their industry but not so much at looking outside of the industry. A couple of years ago, Affinity Sutton carried out a project that looked to benchmark ourselves against industries we thought had zero relevance to what we did. So this picture of a fire engine is not just to represent the urgency of the situation we're facing. It's also that we were asked to look at this and see how it was laid out. And if you look at how easily accessible everything is in it, perfectly organized, why can't our repairs vans all look like that? It was a bit of a light bulb moment for us to start looking outside of our usual sphere of reference. And I think sometimes as an industry, we can start to think that our problems are unique and therefore our solutions are unique. 
But actually, if we're talking about the future of sustainable living, there are very few industries that we can't learn something from. So there's obviously a lot that we can learn from others, but that doesn't escape the fact that we are going to have to put forward some serious leadership and leadership with conviction in this agenda. This is a picture of our founder, uh, William Sutton. So we have a 100-year heritage at Affinity Sutton, and we want to be here for the next 100 years. To, so to do that, we're going to have to find a sustainable business model. We're actually currently in merger talks at the moment that if we went ahead, it would result in us building 5,000 new homes a year by 2020. If we do want to stay around for the next century, then these houses are going to have to be affordable. They're going to have to be sustainable. But beyond the business model, we're now facing a, a real moral imperative. We found out in a survey recently that one in four of our residents have switched off their heating in the last year to save money. Now, that's a pretty alarming statistic in itself. But actually, when you get out and about on the ground, we carried out a few projects this year, a heating upgrade project in a small community. And we came across a lady in her 60s who had never, ever turned on her heating. This is just totally unacceptable. And things are only going to get worse as incomes are stretched, energy bills rise. And more importantly, I think the disparity is going to widen between what people consider an affordable rent or an affordable mortgage and what it actually costs to live in that home. So we do have a lot of challenges ahead, and we are facing challenging times in social housing at the moment. You know, it's sort of gone beyond uh, tightening of our belts. But we've got to try and stay true to our cause, remember what we're there for, and start spotting some of the opportunities that might come out of the situations we're now facing. Looking to deliver new homes, we're looking more and more at our own land schemes, how we can regenerate existing estates. Is that not surely an opportunity to look to deliver some of this future of sustainable communities? And also, the scale and the volume and the experience of delivering major works packages is still there in the social housing industry. It's not gone away just because we are facing such tough times. And you're starting to see this trend being picked up across the board now. We've got the, the driving lobby now for uh, retrofit as a national infrastructure priority. And we've got the NHS Healthy Towns announcement as well. So these initiatives are starting to show that whether it housing's on stilts or built out of bricks and mortar still, we do really need to be looking beyond the physical environment. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Some uh, very wide-ranging and interesting views there. I'd like to open up for questions. I'm going to kick those off myself with the chair's prerogative. Um, uh, really around the sort of the why it makes sense for you respectively and your organizations to, to be leaders. So um, Debbie, if I can start with you from the legal and general perspective, you're a long-term pension fund manager. You have a fiduciary responsibility to your pension um, it's pensioners, as it were, how do you marry that with the, um, so the, the sustainability considerations that, that you described? And is there occasionally a, a tension there between those two? I think um, it, it's an interesting question that gets debated a lot. Um, and from our point of view, starting off in commercial property, our view is that in order to um, protect the value of the assets, if not enhance the value of assets, we have to be sustainable. And I try and say that every time I speak, that we believe sustainability gives us extra value. The valuation community and commercial property don't actually see that yet, but the hope is that one day they'll catch up with what's actually happening in the market. Similarly, on things like build to rent, um, I think that's going to actually expand this debate and it's going to be very interesting. So if we're operating rental property for its life, it can never be sold, it has to be rented, then there's a lot of quality elements you can build in there, which will mean the operating costs will be a lot lower. So it is still protecting the pension fund money that we're stewards of to actually try and generate affordable but high quality living. Um, at which point, Chris, probably um, would turn to you. you. You, Igloo is renowned for going into uh, developments that many normal, I, I don't wish to <laughs> paint you as abnormal, but many other developers wouldn't touch with a barge pole. How do you, allow, how do you enable that, um, you know, those fairly risky and challenging scenarios to not compromise the quality of what comes out at the end? And, and do you find that you can recoup some of the costs through a price uplift in what you're developing, the product? Yeah. It, in fact, because we tend to work, as you say, in places that the other developers won't go to, quality is actually more important in those locations. You've got to give people a reason to move to, you know, 
a former manufacturing semi-derelict area on the edge of a um, regional city center. So right from the beginning, quality of design in particular um, was first and foremost what we were trying to achieve. But we're also, you know, there's, I've just done the calculation in my head, there's billions, tens of billions actually, of pounds represented in the other three organizations on this panel. We didn't have that. Um, so we were trying to deliberately distinguish ourselves, this is 15 years ago, from the mainstream industry. And 15 years ago, this exhibition didn't exist. Um, everyone said we were mad when we said we thought environmental sustainability was important. Just shows how far we've come over that period. It's a, a radical shift in the landscape and the context within which we're operating. Um, Sarah, you mentioned the business case and you had it up on your slides. Um, is, is there something more tangible that you can point to that Barrett is either measuring or um, it, 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 how, how do you get, overcome that, that challenge around the lack of desirability um, and how do you make the business case for driving up standards in the homes that you build? In, in the, within the business that we're operating, because our focus is around building excellence and customer first, it actually, when we say customer, we actually can take that in a number of ways. Very often people are looking at the end consumer, the end user, the buyer of that home, but we also have other people who are our customers, investors, for example, yeah. and also um, local authorities that we may be buying the land off, the landowners that we're buying the land off. We also have the HCA public authorities that we're buying land from. These are all of our customers, so we need to understand what their drivers are and what's going to benefit them. And I think in terms of sustainability, there are a lot of links in terms of, so what do local authorities want their land to be used for and what benefit do they want that to give to the local community um, as a part of the development? So there are a range of different customers that we have to consider and when we're looking at a particular piece of land or development, those are the things that we will consider as well as obviously what's needed in terms of the homes uh, for the future there in terms of what the demographic is uh, and what the, the marketing data might be telling us. So there's a range of different drivers. And, and has the um, relaxation, which is a kind way of putting it, I think, of the um, regulatory environment actually um, made any impact on, on the, the business's ability to sort of make the case for driving up standards? I, I think there's just a, there's probably a shift in focus in terms of we, we are still committed to, to delivering quality homes. We are still de, de, committed to delivering those homes that are energy efficient and using our, what we call the fabric first, fit and forget philosophy, which is essentially concentrating on making sure that the home that the person buys is as, as well insulated as it can be without them having to do anything. It's, it's that easy, it's about choice editing in a way. It's, it's this is what you're getting and this is um, without any of the potential other whistles and bells that, that may not be something that they find necessarily desirable or are willing to pay extra for. And that's where the developer takes the risk in terms of who's going to pay for that extra element to that, to that development if it's not included within the land value that we have to take on or the sale value. So we're taking the risk, but the, the end consumer may not wish to have it. So that there is a fine balance there, There's I think, between the commercials and the, and the, um, the sustainability um, aspirations. Let me just turn to Alex for a moment before opening out to, uh, do we have a roving mic? Yeah, we do, great. So people ought to maybe put their hands up so that you know where to go. Um, but um, Alex, you talk quite a lot about the moral obligation, which I'm really um, interested in. And I just wonder if you could tell us a bit more from the perspective of a social, a socially responsible business effectively, um, which, which is uh, what Affinity Sutton is. What do you think, it, it, do you think there's a greater moral obligation for a business like yours? Or do you think um, you know, the moral obligation should be a, a key part of the why for any organization at this point in time? Um, well, I think uh, it is a strong, it's a strong driver for us because of the nature of the people that we house, um, who are perhaps more likely to struggle with some of their bills. Um, but 
personally, I think it should be a big driver for, for all people. And interestingly, actually, we've um, had a call in recently to our call center from a number of our shared owners who were struggling with their bills, which shows that this is really going to be something that starts to spread a bit further out, I think. Um, and also, when you start to look at the impact of fuel poverty, not just on the individual, but on your business, and there's a lot of research going on at the moment in the social housing sector around how if people can't pay their bills, does that mean they can't pay their rent? Does that mean that, they're, you know, that there are more repairs? It's a, better, it's a less well-maintained home? How you can start to see the knock-on effects. But I think at the end of the day, and this is often the argument you make, we make internally to the business, you know, we want houses where people want to move into, want to live in, want to stay in, and want to be able to pay their rent. And if that isn't a sustainable house, then I, I don't know what is. Very good. Thank you. Um, any questions from the audience? We have a mic over there. Oh, you've got a mic as well. Any questions? There's one at the back, Julie. There's one at the back, just there. Uh, thank you, Alina Congreve from University of Hertfordshire. Um, a question for Debbie. Um, as an institutional investor, um, how important do you find some kind of external tool or verification? So something like Passive House or AECB marking or LEED and of the sort of plethora of tools that are out there, what, what things do you think are important as an institutional investor for a, a tool or some, some kind of quality assurance mark to have? Okay, um, really good question, thank you. Um, I'll start with the commercial property because that's where we've done most. We haven't actually built these houses yet. So in commercial property, property we always use Briam and I say that's because it's the only show in town and the planners insist on it that at least gives us a starting point to maybe end up with a commercial building and I say maybe because just to keep dispelling myths Briam excellent doesn't mean you have a sustainable building in use so for us the real indicator is how we make sure buildings are sustainable in their use and operation when we start looking at the housing market I think that's even more interesting um, I'm really intrigued by the BRE's new home quality mark because obviously the code to sustainable homes isn't there really anymore. So the home quality mark trying to put what I see as sustainability into language that occupants and house owners could actually relate to in terms of how much does it cost me to run my, ha my home, how, much, um, how environmentally friendly are the products and also the way it's operated. And then what's the community like I'm living in? Do I like living in this community? You know, do I want access to parks? Do I want access to gyms and creches? And how does that go forward? I think really interestingly in commercial property without the labels, it's why the valuation community are saying they can't relate sustainability to value. So there is really no way of labeling commercial offices. There's display energy certificates and as LNG, we started creating something called Voldex, which allowed landlords and buildings owners to, to label buildings. But there's no universally used label in the whole of Europe that would allow you to compare an office block in London to one in Amsterdam and say which one is more sustainable. And without that, the valuers say they can't put a value on it. So really important, I think, to answer your question in two words, um, being able to label buildings. Can I just ask the rest of the panel just to comment, if you have comments on, the, on this issue of labeling, standards, benchmarks, ratings, do you use them? Are they useful? Uh, you know, how do you compare like for like if you don't use them? Any other thoughts on, on that before we, we move on to another question? Um, we tend not to use them because, uh, as Debbie says, consumers, um, they, they don't have widespread consumer acceptance and widespread consumer acceptance will take an enormous amount of marketing efforts to achieve I think um, so we focus very much on our footprint processes to achieve the same results um, we what we find in custom build um, is that uh, and I, I mean I, I must say I think Barrett's are the best of the bunch um, but but, <laughs> but you, you, you did answer Julie's question, in, um, uh, which I took to be a kind of lowest common denominator type of way that, that the organization was responding to um, the change in, in the legislation. And, and you, Julie, said something at the beginning that customers won't pay for environmental upgradings. What we find in Custom Build, actually, is that on average, customers will pay 
and that's, but that's made up of the lowest common denominator customers that won't, and then quite a large group of customers that will, and that raises the average. Um, and so it's less about um, putting kind of kite marks on houses and much more about giving people informed choices. Did you have any thoughts on that, Sarah? I'd, I'd say Alice? that, um, I suppose if you look at the way we talk about, um, we, we use the language of energy efficiency and how, it, how much a house will cost to run or compare it to you know, what a comparable Victorian sort of three or four bed terrace in terms of running costs. So that's how our um, marketing teams are um, taught, trained, given the pointers to in terms of talking to their uh, customers about how much it costs to run. Um, so we talk in the language of energy efficiency because that's something that people can get hold of and you know, cost to run bills. Yeah. Any thoughts? I think I'd probably just briefly, briefly add that um, I sort of mentioned the decent home standard there. I think what we're starting to find is um, standards really don't work for our um, organisations because there are so many different needs and different outcomes that you're having to cater for. And I think I'd agree with Chris that it's about transparency to the user. If they're understanding what they're, what they're being offered and if they're understanding how to use what's yeah. in the home, that's probably more important. Thank you. There was a question here at the front. This lady in red, where the mic's got to. Oh. Hi. Hi. Um, Jan Chadwick, Cambridge K1 Co-housing, uh, which I hope you know about. Uh, it's a question, really, and an observation. We seem to have a different definition of sustainability. We have a definition of sustainability from a house build point of view, a, a, a structural point of view, and then we have a definition of community sustainability, really represented by your um, housing uh, association at um, Affinity Sutton. And my question is, have any of your organizations looked at co-housing as a su sustainable model for community? Who would like to take that first? Co-housing? <laughs> is everyone looking at me? <laughs> Um, we have, and um, much as I love the work that, that you're doing, um, we have decided it's a challenge too far for us at the moment. Um, so we started with the idea of giving customers individual choice uh, over the design of their own homes. So individual custom build, and that tends to be in a terraced house model. We're just moving on to group custom build, where groups of people come together to build an apartment building together. Um, I'm just about, literally, uh, the day after tomorrow, to meet someone who wants to take that concept and um, turn it into co-housing in Brighton, actually for older women, and I think co-housing in older age groups is a particularly interesting concept. Um, I, I, I'm struggling to decide personally whether that's the environment that I would want to live in, but I know a number of my friends that do. Um, so, and then the thing that we're debating in kind of thinking about this meeting is how far down the co-housing continuum do we want to go? You know, do we want to get as far as the cooking rotors end of the spectrum? Or is it enough just to, for example, have um, an element of kind of sharing economy where you might share washing machines, for example, and, and maybe there's a communal space that's a party room that people can have at various times. Um, so for us, I think it's, it's kind of, we're, we're here on our learning curve and co-housing is kind of here. I think we're heading in that direction, but we're not there yet. Any other thoughts on, on the topic? I'm going to Debbie? make a comment, which is, is sort of around the subject. I think when you start looking at build to rent, that concept gets really interesting in terms of um, the mix in the build to rent to create a good community. A lot of it is about 
the social aspect of the communities we're going to create with Build to Rent. So how do we ensure that that community is actually valuable to its wider community? Um, and how do we make sure we work with the local authority to identify needs that the people living there could help with and vice versa? Um, and also what shared facilities you want. So a lot of our guys have been doing research um, in um, the States and in Holland and places. And they've come back with all sorts of concepts, um, especially having shared cinemas, shared dining areas. So you have a very small apartment. But if you want your friends to come and stay, you rent a room and you cook them dinner, you rent a roof terrace, you take them to the cinema and you all watch that. The one I really love is shared pets. So in the States, they had a shared dog and there's an internet website. So if you want to go and walk the dog, you book your, slide, your site um, and then you go and walk the dog. But it actually, um, when the dog was sick, Everybody said, you know, all anybody was talking in the corridor was about whether, the, you know, Fred the dog is all right anymore. So it actually helped bind people together as well. But really interesting concept, yeah. Shared pets, floating homes, co-homes. <laughs> We're going quite radical on this session. Um, I wanted to ask you each to respond, if you had one insight, given that this is a leadership insight session, um, to share with us and the audience around what it takes to develop that transformational leadership, whether that is at the industry level, at the organizational level, or as, as an individual, what would it be? And it could just be a, you know, a lesson, an observation, a piece of advice. Um, what, what would that be um, to share with the team? And maybe Debbie, I'll start, start with you. Yeah. Give the others a bit I'll, of time. I'll try and be as radical as I can. I think the main thing is it's got to come from the sector voluntarily. So the leadership we need going forward is not going to come from government and regulation. I think we're all agreed on that. So it's really about what we can do as an industry. Um, and then looking at LNG, I know that you know, throughout the organization, right up to our CEO, Nigel Wilson, there's a belief that we have um, a responsibility with the long-term capital we look after to help push in different directions voluntarily on all sorts of aspects. So sustainability, but renewables, you know, helping support the grid infrastructure. So um, I think my answer is we've got to do things voluntarily. Yeah. Thank you. Chris. Um, I mean, we, we, we do set out explicitly to try and change the industry. And the way we try and provide as a minnow leadership to this humongous super tanker of a, a, of a housing industry um, is showing different ways of doing things. So I'm a, a massive fan of seeing is believing and you know, hopeful that our, as we start rolling out, for example, our custom build projects, um, some of the big house builders will work out that that's actually a better way on so many different levels of delivering housing. Yep, great, thank you. Sarah? I agree with all of those, but um, I think from our perspective, there's probably two things is, is we know that the sector has got to change. We know that the sector has got to um, build more houses, build them more efficiently, and build them with 50% less carbon. So we've all got to change. We've all got to uh, learn. Uh, and I think we've all got to, to listen as well. So I think part of the work that we're doing is trying to listen and understand. And actually, on development scale, or whether it's across the whole organization, we really need to understand where we can find those overlaps. and have a better understanding of where the business case is yeah. for each of the partners that we work with. Great, thank you. Alex, last but not least. I think probably for me it would be around, and we could just be, because that's what I'm working the most at the moment, but around the, this value of sustainability, because I think um, you know, the Green Deal was actually one step forward and they recognized that for the householder there was a value, but that has now broadened out so much wider so that we can start to see with projects like the lenders projects that there is a value to mortgage lenders, with the NHS towns, there's a value, there's a real a tangible value to, uh, to health providers. And actually, just from, from a day-to-day -day job point of view, um, we have to submit a value for money statement as a, as a housing association. And by far, the easiest to articulate and biggest section of that statement is about the sustainability work that we do. So it's really starting to broaden that out and really put it into practice what that value is. Thank you very much for your responses. I'm conscious I need to draw this session to a close. Um, some really interesting insights there on leadership from voluntary action 
to uh, ch challenging the status quo, I think is how I'd summarize yours, Chris. Um, listening is a really, really good one, I think. And then this whole piece around value and, and business case. We um, at UKGVC did a, um, we, we were actually in the middle of doing a survey of chief execs of many of our member organizations. And I thought I'd share with you just some of the snippets that are already coming out that are fairly interesting, one of which relates directly to this issue around the moral imperative. So 87% of the chief execs that we surveyed pointed to the moral imperative as being the key factor that was driving them to take action on sustainability well above uh, all others, um, financial performance, stakeholder management, et cetera. So, um, Really quite startling, I thought, um, uh, finding. Uh, more than half of them claimed to be personal champions of sustainability within their organizations. I have to say, I might challenge that slightly on some, uh, on some of those, but um, they, they do at least demonstrate an intent to be uh, the personal champions behind the sustainability vision of the organization. And again, more than half felt that this issue of collaboration, partnerships with suppliers, cross-industry, um, uh, sort of fertilization, as it were, and behavior and culture change were some of the key opportunities to unlocking um, some of the blockages to us achieving really quite a lot more, um, a lot faster. So just a few snippets there. I mean, that's, that's partly why we intend to push this leadership agenda even more strongly in, in the coming years, and we'll continue to bring current and future leaders together um, to challenge the status quo and uh, we're, 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 we'll hopefully produce more material around all of that but for now please join me in thanking our panelists very much and um, I hope you have a productive rest of your eco world thank you